if I can indulge a reading, but I just love when you are born with sex appeal in a forest called Hollywood. Oh, you'll find more wolves at your back door than that little red riding hood. Now she and her little old grandma could have learned from the men I've dated that a wolf can be quite a devotee once he's domesticated. Want to listen to this Ivory Tower Boiler Room or True Crime and Academia episode ad-free? Head on over to our Patreon where I'm giving you all seven days of a free trial. So p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com backslash Ivory Tower Boiler Room. And if you join the ITBR professor level, which you'll see gets you access to all of our rewatch podcast series like Queer as Folk and Smash, and all of our Teaches series, including when we rewatched Scream with you all, when we discussed The Exorcist, we're about to do a Britney Spears memoir episode. So, oh, and The Fall of the House of Usher is coming up. You also get access to both book clubs. And while you're at it, while you're joining our Patreon, where you're getting your seven days for free, I would really love if you Make sure you like and follow us on Apple or Spotify, and please leave a review. It really does help us in terms of advertisers and sponsors. Thank you all for listening to the Ivory Tower Boiler Room Network, and it is just wonderful to be part of this arts and culture organization and have you all out there reach out to me. So again, remember, follow us on Instagram and TikTok at Ivory Tower Boiler Room. And we have a Facebook and we're on X as well. Enjoy this episode, everyone. When you need mealtime inspiration, it's worth shopping Baker's, where you'll find over 30,000 mouth-watering choices that excite your inner foodie. And no matter what tasty choice you make, you'll enjoy our everyday low prices, plus extra ways to save, like digital coupons worth over $600 each week. You can also save up to $1 off per gallon at the pump with fuel points. More savings and more inspiring flavors make shopping Baker's worth it every time. Baker's, fresh for everyone. Fuel restrictions apply. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Ivy Tower Boiler Room Rewatches. Today, we'll be discussing Smash, episode four of season one, The Cost of Art. Today with us, we have Elizabeth Winder, the author of Maryland Manhattan. Elizabeth, how are you? Hi, I'm great. I'm really excited to be here discussing this show and, and all things Marilyn Monroe, of course. Yes, yeah. and we're so glad to have you on. Andrew, do you want to start us off? Yeah. Hi, everyone. I'm here because, you know, when Elizabeth's in the ivory tower boiler room, I need to appear. Um, I feel like we're reliving our blonde moments, Elizabeth. Um, oh, and I, was thinking, I have been thinking about that, too. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Not the stereotype of people who are blonde, everyone out there. <laughs> the movie blondes. I mean, <laughs> oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, I guess like what I first wrote about this episode is. Um, and I can like say to everyone, I'm so happy that Elizabeth is joining us also for five. So you all can like anticipate that because I feel like this is a good um, like precursor. And when someone is like running a race in the Olympics, like where they get that head start, I feel like this is a good head start, but it's not um, as impactful yet. Like it really builds us to episode five, but um I have here the first rehearsal. I feel like I was just curious what you like both of you thought about um, Karen and her being in the ensemble, because um, I felt like it really builds this tension between her and Ivy. And I, oh. I'm just wondering how much of this is psychologically concocted between them or how much of this is Derek actually um, igniting, like, and manipulating them against each other. Yeah. Do you want to go first, Kristen? I can. Um, I mean, when I was re-watching it, um, I actually never thought about that, that it was all Derek's doing. Um, and we'll discuss that again in episode five, because it is ugh, it's big on there. Um, but with this, with hers wanting Karen to either, I believe that he pushed her back into the um, ensemble at this point, um, or chorus as I'd like to call it. Um, 
it's just it gives Karen a, a bit of like agency but again she's oh woe is me I'm in the chorus blah 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 and it's just it's very she's in her own head and it makes it makes Ivy seem like she's the most popular girl in school you know <laughs> yeah oh to yeah, remind yeah. everyone too just um this is when right Karen is um upstaging as you would call it in theater yes. lingo like she's drawing attention away from uh ivy and like yeah. she's in ivy's mind over singing over dancing and mm -hmm. um like karen has this line where she says well um or actually i don't think that's her line but um i was just like wondering with elizabeth like how would marilyn have reacted in this scenario as Ivy or as as Karen? I guess as either. Ooh. Like if you think Marilyn has been in both of their positions before. Yeah, you know, as um, I and, and, and the whole time I'm thinking like I I don't know how much of the point how much of the point of the show this is, but I'm trying to see Marilyn in the characters in in Ivy, but also I see her in Karen a little bit. Um, I don't. From what I know about Marilyn Monroe, I I don't see her as being somebody who would ever be upset or even, or even it, it would, I don't think it would ever occur to her that a woman was upstaging her. Mm -hmm. I think that it might occur to her that sometimes like men are upstaging her in a, in a different way. Um, because, well, for, well, for one, and I don't want to derail the conversation, but these, these types of musicals, um, when she did a lot with 20th Century Fox, you know, that was such a, I mean, they have the, the um, that number, the Fox Mambo, the 20th Century Fox Mambo. So they're actually referencing it. They were just churning out these musicals and um, filming these musicals. It was really, really hard on her, you know, like in a one like uh, Gentlemen Prefer Blondes, you can't really tell how difficult it is because the dancing, I think, is so like effortless looking on her part. But it was, it was really tough. And anyway, I don't see that. I don't see her responding at all the way Ivy did in that, in that sort of way. Um, I think that, and one thing that I did think about was this like pitting the, the pitting two young, I don't want to say starlet because that's not what I mean. And they're not, that they're not starlets, but you know what I mean? These young a actresses, women together, putting them against each other. That was a technique that the studios did a lot. They would kind of concoct these fake fights or like cat fights for the sake of drumming up publicity. And that's what made me think, is this Derek's doing? And then, of course, later on, I'm thinking, oh, boy, he is a problem. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, wait, and Gentlemen Prefer Blondes, that's with Jane Russell and Marilyn, right? Yes. And those okay. two actually had a wonderful friendship filming um, that one. I think that that's why with uh, Gentlemen Prefer Blondes, it was a little less harrowing for Marilyn than say one that she did after there's no business like show business plus gentlemen prefer blondes just such a better film you know was based off a musical um if she believed in the script a lot more but yeah I don't I don't see her I I think that one of the things that I was sort of thinking the whole time was seeing the ways that Ivy is very different than Marilyn Monroe but then the ways that she's is sort of in other ways um capturing some something elemental about her yeah oh judy garland is in there's no business like show business right is that the variety movie i think you know i never saw the whole thing but I've, it's it's where she's um it this one song that's in it is uh the tropical heat wave we're having a heat wave she's got this crazy thing on her head Marilyn. it's doing a song and dance yeah um, christian i was gonna say christian is like all things classical classical cinema. Is that the one where there's like multiple stars, Christian, doing different? Also, Merman in there with um yeah. with what's his name? There's one who's who wants to be a priest, but you can tell that he's gay, and I'm just like, what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but the pitting of the women against each other, Elizabeth, you're right. It's something that was so realistic with the studio system. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Because they were doing it and they did it mainly to drum up publicity. But I also think that they did it so that these studio execs like Daryl Zanuck could remain in power. You mm -hmm. pit them against the women against each other. That's a way of disempowering them. Yeah. 
Um, so like, I'm even just curious about like, how do you think Marilyn would have reacted to her life being made into a musical? I think she would have loved it. Yeah. <laughs> I think she would have looked at it with curi with um with with curiosity and an open mind because those mm. two qualities are totally curiosity and open mind Marilyn core qualities. Um that's sort of how she approached things in general. Yeah. Well, like in Christian, I remember on our first ever like you launching this in the first episode, we had done like this whole analysis, Elizabeth, about Karen and Ivy are kind of really playing foils of Marilyn. Like they, like we even asked, could there be a musical of her with only one woman? Or does it make sense that there's two women representing different psych psychological aspects of her? That's um, interesting. Yeah. I think that that's, yeah, I could really see that. It's sort of like foils of Marilyn, but it kind of like, um, you know, Marilyn out there, I don't think there's anyone on earth who has ever existed who was as much of like a, the idea of a person, right? She means something, multiple things to to everyone and who was she really? So you, there's the Karen side of Marilyn that people sort of see, which is the, the girl who came from nothing. I mean, Marilyn was California, not the, not Iowa, but you know what I mean? Like um, sort of um, not... Uh, unsophisticated do you know what I mean that 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 all of that and it, it, quite innocent um and then there's that like va va boom vampy pin up <laughs> very styled Marilyn that she kind of helped create herself as and um and these and the two of them are almost like shadows of each other mm -hmm. it would be almost interesting to see the same actress like playing two different roles yeah. And that's really what I don't know. I mean, when they bring this to Broadway, Elizabeth, New York City trip for you. I feel like we all have to be there when they bring yes. this to Broadway, because I really have a feeling they're going to have multiple women. And I think they should, because I um, it's like what we discussed, Elizabeth, when they try to cast one um, actress as Marilyn, like. It's well, actually, I have to say, I don't think it's the like acting of who plays Marilyn. I think it's what happens when the different men are brought in at different stages True. of her life, especially in Blonde. I actually really loved Anna de Armas's interpretation. I did too. I did too. And I think, and and I think that um, the relationships with the men, I mean, the I mean, the men that she had real relationships with, um, consensual relationships with DiMaggio, Miller, um, they were. I liked that. I liked the acting there too. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So Christian, what's our next, what do you have, you know, to jump into for us? Oh goodness. Um, well, I do love the instant, uh, friending of all these different ensemble casts that we have. We have Wesley Taylor. We have, um, the other two uh, girls that kind of that kind of cheer Karen on, I think, and I think that's really empowering for her. And I really did love that moment where they just they went into her apartment building and they just started taking out all her clothes and they're like, "What's this? No, we got to get rid of this. We got to." They did a whole. I love that too. Yeah, a yeah. Whole wardrobe malfunction change. So it was it was amazing, and I love that that they did that. And then after that, they sat down on the couch and they were talking, they were laughing, they were just having fun, and that's what I think is amazing about the show is that they can take they can be Broadway but they can also be um humbling and honest and raw with each other while being while this being a musical show they're also being able to say okay well we're at home we're gonna we're this we're not we're not in Broadway mode we're just relaxing we're chatting we're shooting the breeze and then all of a sudden they're in a they're they're trying to get Karen to get into dance mode because they need to get her to learn these freaking steps because she's apparently she's too much of a hick to understand. <laughs> I'm like, that kind of sounds a little bit demeaning for her. Hi, this is Dr. Andrew Rimby. And when I'm not here on the podcast, I am consulting with small businesses, undergraduate students, graduate students, 
podcasters, and those in media. So if you're curious about the work that I've done with my consultation services, you could just type me in on Google, Ivory Tower Boiler Room, and you'll see a few reviews pop up. I've worked on college admission essays for undergraduate students. I've revamped and expanded a small business's social media marketing campaign right here in Port Jefferson, New York. And I've also worked on a graduate student's thesis for her physician assistant program. So if you want to seek me out or inquire about my consultation services, just email me. That's the easiest way to reach me at ivorytowerboilerroom at gmail.com. That's easy to remember. And tis the season for college admission essays, both undergraduate and graduate, thesis writing, dissertation writing. Um, do you want to create a podcast and you don't know where to begin? Media work, um, how to open a TikTok, how to start creating videos on TikTok, what to do with your Instagram, all of that I have done. So just reach out to me. Also, I'm really excited to announce that the December book club choice is Britney Spears's The Woman in Me memoir. So to join the book club, head to ivorytowerboilerroom.com and go to events and you're going to see a form there just so I know how many of you are joining the book club. And that way I can reach out to each of your email addresses and poll all of you to see what date at the end of December works. It's going to be the week after Christmas. So don't worry, it's not going to be the week of Christmas. That would be hectic. And then I'll let you all know how to join the book club, which happens on Patreon. You just join under the ITBR book club section. So can't wait to see who wants to discuss Britney Spears. We have a lot to dissect there. And in the also, if you want to join the Wicked Broadway Musical group event, which is happening in March, head to that event section on the website and fill out that Google form by December 1st. Ah, so much happening here in the Ivory Tower Boiler Room, and I love this community. I love being the host and director of this arts and culture organization. Thank you all for supporting me. It means so much. And please spread the word for my consultation services, for the podcast, the book club, the Broadway musical, group event, all the things. And without further ado, Here's today's episode. LGBT stories are universal, but each one speaks to the individual heart and soul of the writer telling it. Do you have a story to tell? Or have you been moved by an LGBT book, film, painting, television show, or other form of media? Then the Gay and Lesbian Review wants to hear from you. The GNLR believes in bringing awareness to queer art and artists through reviews, commentary, and thought pieces in which the author relates their personal lives to a particular piece of art, a novel, a movie. In addition to the print magazine, the GNLR also publishes articles on its blog. So you can see all of this on glreview.org. That's G-L-R-E-V-I-E-W.org. Remember, you get 50% off your subscription of the GL Review magazine when you use the promo code ITBR50. That's 50% off your print or digital subscription when you use promo code ITBR50. To learn more about submitting an article for the GNLR, Visit their writer's guidelines. The link is located at the bottom of their homepage. And if you have any questions, email Stephen Hemrick. That's S-T-E-P-H-E-N dot H-E-M-R-I-C-K at glreview.org. The GNLR and its readers can't wait to see what you have to say. In her in her aspect. I don't know what you two thought about it when you guys it saw it. It was very human. It was a very human moment, very with with so much warmth. And I really liked that part too. Um, you know what else I liked that was leading up to that? Right before they were went to her apartment, they were um, I think it was before, they were all at a shop, like at a, at a I think probably like a dance clothing store boutique. I loved that part because I I have this like niche obsession with like off-duty dancer slash ballerina practice clothes even though I'm not a dancer I have absolutely no business wearing them myself <laughs> I have I love them and I love the specificity that the one because there's one guy with them one guy and two girls and I and I think he's the one who says like wear the flesh tone tights 
and then the fishnets on top to add texture. I was like, oh, I do that. Like, <laughs> I love that look. I like how they're uh, the sweater with like the neck cut, the neckline cut off. <laughs> and then the next time you see her at practice, she's got the sweater with the neckline cut off. I love that those like sheer ballet dance sweaters. So I always love that. I always love um, bringing in dance clothes, not the, not the performance clothes, but like the practice clothes. There's, there's something so cool about it. <laughs> And I love how like they break, she breaks down and then they see her humanity. Like, because I think they didn't realize how psychologically under duress she is. They, they're like, they, right, it was yeah. obvious they didn't. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I think they're being fed so much from Ivy's perspective. And Derek's, I guess, too, yeah. to, to an extent. I the, the girl, I forget her name, but the girl that Karen kind of has that you know meltdown with emotional moment in the hallway um mm. when there was like this pause uh, and I'm and I was thinking oh boy she's gonna say something really mean and kick her while she's down but she didn't and I was like so I it just really smiled and I was so happy then to see that because then it was the cut to the clothing store and they're helping her out and I just I just really loved that yeah yeah who is that actress do you know Christian I'm trying to remember. Yeah, I couldn't. It wasn't like someone I instantly. Well, Leslie Odom Jr. is in this episode. And I mean, like now Leslie Odom Jr. is known so much for Hamilton and like, oh, he's in Pearly Victorious on Broadway and was in the Exorcist movie recently. Um, yeah. There were, it's interesting. Of, there were a lot of actors that I'm like thinking, I think I've seen this person, like the, the, the actor who plays Derek, I seems very oh, yeah. familiar. I've watched so many British things, so I'm sure I've seen him many times in college. His name is Jack Everport. He was in Pirates of the Caribbean. Um, oh, okay. Things. Yeah, yeah. Uh, um, Christian's going to find the ensemble names. Um, I feel like I've seen her definitely before on Broadway. Um, but... Like Elizabeth. Uh, Savannah Wise. Her name is Jessica. She plays Jessica. Oh, uh, Savannah, Savannah Wise. Wise. Okay. Leslie Taylor's Bobby. And then you have, what's her name? Um, I'll have to see what she's in. But were you surprised that Angelica Houston and Deborah Messing were in this, Elizabeth? I was surprised and thrilled. Mm -hmm. A big, I, I love both of them. And um, it's, it's great to see them in this. I think that they're, they both do are doing an amazing job. Um, they're both great actors. And I really, they're, Angelica Houston in the scene with the, with the Degas um, hmm. drawing or, or painting, like she's, it, she's very capturing these really subtle, powerful emotions that are like just powerful emotions that she controlled, you know, from her characters, like, you know, trying to control them. And it's really, it's really beautiful to watch. Yeah. Oh, this is interesting. Um, Savannah Wise was Evelyn Nesbitt in the revival of Ragtime before the Smash show. That's like one of my favorite musicals. I love, you know. I saw um, Ragtime on Broadway in the 90s. <laughs> you saw the original, Elizabeth. <laughs> Wait, did you see it with Audrey McDonald? I, for, I forget. I think it would have been 1996. So I'm not sure. It was a school. It was an overnight or weekend field trip to New York City. Oh, that's so fun. <laughs> yeah. Well, I didn't even we like didn't even ask you, do you have a background, Elizabeth? Because I don't know this in theater. Like, have you ever performed? Absolutely not. I never have. Um, although I have I have fantasies of like joining a theater troupe and where I, all, all I do is play Blanche Dubois over and over again. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like a fever dream or some a nightmare. That's so funny. Oh my gosh. Um yeah, but okay, let me just see. Oh, so oh that's right. They're rehearsing Never Met a Wolf Who Didn't Love to Howl. Well, Never Met a Wolf is the song. Um, but yeah, Christian, I mean, I know you have a lot of thoughts about this song. Like, is this one of your favorite numbers, Christian? Oh. It was. It was until, until I rewatched the next episode. Um, mm -hmm. That musical number became my new favorite. Um, but I've always loved the slim, 
the slim the the simplicity of the mm-hmm. lyrics on this song because Megan is able Megan Hilty is able to become Marilyn in two seconds flat once she gets once she's like okay do it be Marilyn and she's just mm-hmm. able to go into that character mode and just perform and that's what I love about Megan Hilty is she's just she's just an accomplished and amazing actress and she's just yes. able to like Glenn Close's criminal difficulty she's just able to just become the character and mm-hmm. at the drop of a hat and that's what I love about her performing this, as this, this is Ivy that actress who plays oh, Ivy yeah. Yes. yeah I I noticed that too that's slipping into it kind of and the voice and the and the way that the, the vibrato is just like mm-hmm. it's just it's so not an incredible voice you know yeah. that's a that's actually that's actually another difference between her and Marilyn Monroe who I think Marilyn Monroe in her own way is a great singer but she doesn't have anywhere near the range I mean she's this when listening to the um I, Ivy, I forget the actress's name, saying this is clearly somebody who's trained, I think, right? To, to be able to, that that range is, is really impressive. Yeah, like Marilyn wasn't a belter. Yeah. No. Um, <laughs> but she was good at like whispery, like very, um, like highlighting um, her register to like yes. connect she was- with, she was a modem. Exactly. She's very specific within a certain range. I mean, like she, you know, she sings in Gentlemen Prefer Blondes and those songs are great. But even those songs, she's kind of whispering a little bit, you know, because um, and it sounds lovely, but it's a sort of like a whispery thing. thing. You know, the um, I Never Met a Wolf song. I loved that, too. And when I was watching it, I thought this makes me think so much of a song in a good way that could have been in Gentlemen Prefer Blondes. Mm. Last night I was watching clips of Gentlemen Prefer Blondes, like, cause they're just, it's just so, I love that. I love that movie and this, the, the songs in it are just so great. It's, there's so much like uh, joy in it. And the way I'm not, I don't have a music background, don't have a theater background, but the, so the music really did remind me of something that could have appeared there. The lyrics did, the musical structure did. The yeah. choreography of the dances did in a mm-hmm. lot of ways. In the best yeah, way. It's it's so big band. I mean, that's what I love about um Mark Shaman and Scott Whitman, who are doing the music and lyrics, is they did hairspray, they did some like it hot on Broadway right now. Like they're so good at these like period pieces of the 50s and 60s. Yeah, um, that makes sense. If there's if there's a real understanding of that type of music at that time. Yeah. yeah. Well, and actually, it is called I Never Met a Wolf Who Didn't Like to Hell. I just looked it up. Apparently, that's the actual name of the song. But um, I, what I just love is like the playfulness of the lyrics. I mean, if I can indulge a reading, but... I just love when you are born with sex appeal in a forest called Hollywood. I'll find more wolves at your back door than that little red riding hood. Now she and her little old grandma could have learned from the men I've dated that a wolf can be quite a devotee once he's domesticated. I love I mean, that too. <laughs> so good. Like the forest of Hollywood, I think is like a great as a as a poet, I just like that imagery, you know? It's 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 really cool. Like we forget that it really was at that time, a forest. Yeah. What totally was. I mean, when you think about it at that time, Hollywood was a forest. Mm-hmm. And that's what that's what they're able to do. Like they're able to capture that imagery of MGM and 20th Century Fox and those those types of musicals. And they're just able to bring you to the back end of what it was like and how how Marilyn was able to define herself and just gain her own agency, which we're going to discuss later on um, with your book, Elizabeth, which I absolutely love. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I love, I the, the, you're totally right about Hollywood being a forest in so, in so many ways. You know, we for, I think that I forget at least sometimes just how long ago, like the early 50s were when you mm. think about it. Um, and because they were a really long time I mean well relatively speaking of course right Mm -hmm. but um it was it was very close to that big band era it's like Hollywood was still um in its 
kind of early phases. You know, Chaplin was still really big when you think about it. Like there was, it was a very much still that early Hollywood. Yeah. Well, and I think you would love Elizabeth that Megan Hilty actually performs the concert version of Gentlemen Prefer Blondes. So oh, she ends yes. up being Lorelai. And right, the original Gentlemen Prefer Blondes was with Carol Channing. Um, mm -hmm. And it's like over the top campy yes. with her like Little Rock interpretation. And and I feel like that's kind of like what Megan Hilty, she accesses the sultry like over the top campy pinup, like you called it a pinup image. I think that's amazing way of thinking. And I feel like Catherine McPhee, McPhee really brings in the Marilyn, um, her intellectual side of yes. how she's thinking of her everyday nuance. Yes, and her movements, Catherine McPhee's, I mean, are have the, the soft, a little bit of softness mm -hmm like Marilyn's, I mean, people think of Marilyn and and certainly she's different in different films as being campy, but I don't really think that she was a, a sort of, maybe campy isn't even the right word, but there, of course there was that exaggerated femininity, but not to the extent that you that people think really when, um, and there were other actresses that leaned into that way more. Um, I think that like, that the, the Ivy's character is more, much more over the top with that in terms of like performing a certain kind of femininity. Do you know what I mean? Yes. Yes. She's affected. Yes. Yes. Right. There was, there's, there's a real element of, um, I kept thinking at times of, and this is a, a, a fictional character, but, um, if you've ever seen Mad Men, Joan Holloway at times mm. like with the, with the Ivy performance, like there, there's like a real, like sort of like voluptuous confidence um, that I think that Marilyn didn't quite have. Mm -hmm. Well, have you seen The Help, either of you? I have not. Yes, uh, are we talking about, are, are you, am, I, am I thinking what you're thinking about, Jessica Chastain? Yeah, Jessica Chastain oh. plays this like very Marilyn Monroe. Fair enough. Very. It's very interesting. <laughs> I um, love Jessica Chastain. She's I love her. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, it's like even um, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood had, um, oh my gosh, what was the real life actress who sadly was murdered? What? Um, oh, oh, you mean, oh, you mean the Sharon Tate? Yeah, Sharon Tate. Oh, oh, yeah, with Margot Robbie. Played, right, yeah. Yeah, she and they like her. rewrite that history, but I feel like she even like provides that mon like that fairy tale, like I'm going to make it big in Hollywood, and yes. that's why I think the Red Riding Hood imagery is so wonderful because oh, it's so on point. For it's that. like that fairy tale is all about men preying on Red Riding Hood. Like the wolf is really a stand-in for men, um, blasting that fairy tale image of innocence being taken away exactly and starting off with like you know you pack your you, you you're a little ingenue you pack your basket full of bread and you put on your hood and you go out into the forest and you know you don't know what's going to happen and it's might not be very pretty <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah well and i mean what i think they do so well in this series is i always say this to christian every time we come back christian there's so many literary references like it is a really like, because we see the process of the writers with, like, Julia. like That's really with enjoyable to watch. I, I love, love seeing their process. I really like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, let me see. I'm trying to... Oh, oh, my God. Karen finding out that Ivy's sleeping with the director. I don't know. For some reason, this storyline really... Not just the sleeping with the director, but, like, when Karen finds out and, like, spreads it around to the ensemble... I don't know. I feel like there's a lot of that um, happened in this in the seat in episode four or did, in or episode did, four. Okay, yeah. did she previously? So Karen found out in episode four. She didn't know before. Yeah, I don't think she knows before, right, Christian? I don't think so. No, I think it was. It might have been alluded to to other cast members, but it wasn't directly to her. Yeah, I mean, what do you think of the ethics of this whole? Ivy with the director and then everyone knowing about it as an open secret, Elizabeth. 
Well, my initial thought was, why does Karen care so much? Like, <laughs> well, that's true. <laughs> like Ivy is not that nice to her. Ivy can be a pain, but that would, I mean, why, who cares? Like, I mean, I get it, but look at th th this stuff, what do you think is going to happen? But on, so on one level, I'm thinking that, and then on the, I, I I guess I feel like it's at first I thought it is it unrealistic that she would care so much about this. Um, mm. Then I thought, you know what? She, th that's a certain type of personality. I think that there's an element of, and again, this is an aspect of Karen. that's very un Marilyn. There's an aspect of maybe sort of righteousness in Karen. Do you know what I mean? Kind of like, mm. like, the moral authority that you like um I don't know I, I see I'm better that. than you yes I see that glimmer in her <laughs> and mm. I think maybe Ivy sees it too and and other otherwise because I couldn't understand like why she would be that bothered by it the other thing that I was confused about and I I could be wrong about this but does Ivy have a boyfriend that she lives with doesn't she live with a I think she I lives by that. herself. It's Karen that lives with her fiance. Okay, I, right, Karen does. But then there, I guess there's a scene that confused me because Ivy's trying on this dress and a guy zips her up in the dress. Oh, that was that was Lizzie Oldham, but that's like, she's like her gay best friend. That's- okay. So that's not a boyfriend, okay. Oh, the sports, <laughs> yeah, he's gay, but he's like a sports like, fanatic. Yeah. And <laughs> they don't like, no one would, I don't know. There's a whole, well, that's in episode five, but yeah, we'll return to Leslie <laughs> Odom Jr. I see like a straight, a straight or oh, a guy hey, talking hey. about sports, like lying around like a log and I'm thinking, oh, he must be straight, you know? <laughs> There's some gay guys who are into sports, Elizabeth. A few. Um. A selection. Uh, no, no. But um, I'm into the Philly teams when they make it to the series. Um, but then I'm, not that into it. I'm into the gym. Okay. Um, but yeah, you're right though about Karen. Yeah, she's like the holier than thou martyr. I see that. I, but I also just wonder are we led to believe she cares so much about this to use it as a leverage against Ivy as an ammunition? Or B, does she really want to physically be with Derek? Because of a romantic thing, not just because, because of a romantic of attachment. Yeah. I was thinking about both those things too. Yeah. When I know I had said to Elizabeth Christian before we had recorded, I was like, well, how did I describe this? I was like, it's they're they're putting on a Marilyn Monroe musical, but it's um a Broadway soap opera. I don't but the more I watch it, I don't know if it's soap opera y. I think it's I don't know. There's a lot of realism in it. There is. It's way more real than a soap opera. I mean, I've watched mm -hmm. soap operas before. You have somebody coming back as somebody else in a different body and everybody acts like it's normal. Like it's not, <laughs> it's not soap opera. -y. You're right. They're like, <laughs> oh, they're possessed by so-and-so spirit and everyone just nods like, oh yeah, that's normal. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh my God. Definitely um, leans into to personal drama though, which I actually like and enjoy. I mean, I I like that stuff. Yeah. I have a question about Derek. Yeah. What is as somebody who's just kind of jumped into the show here, and I like that actor a lot. Who? What is he doing? <laughs> well, I guess we can get into that later. But yeah. I, I I in the beginning of episode three. Well, mostly through episode three, I thought, oh, Derek kind of seems like an okay guy, you know, like, um, then I'm seeing some sinister behavior. And then I'm seeing some really sinister behavior. Like, so mm -hmm. I'm just wondering what he's aiming for. Like, he is his his eye is on his production, right? Yeah, yeah. So, like, are you talking about... um? You know, just the way that he's manipul or like you think that he's really um almost sinking the cast, like is self-sabotaging the production. I don't know. I don't think he wants to do that. Mm. I think that he's doing I think he's taking on the role of some of the the directors and studio executives did in the fifties, which is like mm. playing little some little cycle, pitting one person against another person 
for the sake of a better production at the expense of the well-being uh, of the cast. Yeah, I feel like he's trying to, I mean, is it just me or is he trying to push them into method acting? I thought I I had I, I had that thought too. I first had that thought at the end of the party with it with it where there was the kid. Who's the kid? Oh, when uh we Nick get the Jones. Jonas brother. Oh we, yeah. There's Nick there. Jonas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like surprise, he's here. <laughs> I thought I it was like, who is this kid? He seems kind of familiar. And I um realized who he was. But at the end of that party, Ivy comes up to him, and this is where and I this was all kind of surprising to me because Ivy notices him flirting with a woman. Mm -hmm. um, and Derek is kind of, the way Derek reacts to her is very much like, he says something like, I, I loved you tonight, or you were great tonight. Kind of like, don't dare blow it with me. That was the, that was sort of the implication or like, you know, I'm gonna chat people up, you know, that's fine, whatever. But it was, that's when he started to appear a little dark to me for the first time. Yes, yes. I feel like I wrote down. Um... Oh sorry, yeah, Lyle. Giving us ahead. No, it's you're good. fine. Yeah, no, no, no. That's right. He's Lyle. Lyle is um, Nick Jonas's. Right. It's Nick Jonas. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, uh, Nick Jonas is someone who Derek and Tom had cast in his first musical, but then he like has made it big on a sitcom. Um, or in like a TV deal. And then Eileen like sees these dollar signs that, oh, he's someone who could like put money behind the musical. Um, which I love that like how they're, um, the whole production team is really using each other. Like Eileen is using everyone for clout, like Lyle. And then, like you said, Elizabeth, I think Derek, you're right. He wants to put on the best production of Bombshell as he can. Actually, I don't know if they even call it Bombshell yet, but whatever. Um, it becomes known as Bombshell, the musical. Um, but I think it's so interesting because he's really gaslighting Ivy this whole time. And I think it's on purpose. He's definitely doing this on purpose. It seems very deliberate. He seems like he knows exactly what he's doing. He also seems like he's supposed to be somewhat older than her. Um mm -hmm. He certainly looks like he is. I mean, maybe the age gap isn't massive, but that there's certainly that power mm -hmm. like gap too. But I, I mean, he's 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 he seems like he's somebody who likes to manipulate people. Yeah, and I feel like Tom is also manipulating his personal assistant. Um, but the personal assistant also, um, he's like the one who, um, yeah, keeps, um reporting to Eileen eventually in episode five, but um, Tom like giving, again? so Tom is um the, uh, he's writing the music. Oh, he's the one who goes on the date with the cute guy at the stage. Yes, <laughs> the lawyer. Yeah, 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 yeah. That, um, that their mom set up for him. I wish my mom would do that. <laughs> I know, I know. But, and then I question Julia a lot, not in this episode, but eventually we'll have to get Ooh. into it. I'm like starting to question what she's doing with the actor who's playing Joe DiMaggio. I'm, I'm just like inclined to like Julia right now because I maybe it's just, I like Deborah Messing. So I'm, yeah. <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, oh, I like her. It seems like she likes the Joe DiMaggio guy or he's certainly likable, you know? Mm -hmm. um, or just, or you, you're thinking maybe she is kind of, getting involved in a personal way to manipulate as well. I don't know if she's manipulative. I think she likes to play with fire. Um, mm -hmm. But he does too. <laughs> After getting a thrill that. out of it. I think they're all playing with fire. I mean, yeah. I think, I don't know. Well, do you think the Broadway industry, Elizabeth, because Marilyn was never on Broadway, was she? She was not. I mean, she really, her her real dream certainly in in um 1954 1955 1956 was to be in an actor in the the way of like like Brando mm -hmm. Paul Newman um and Bancroft you know the, the others that the actor studio who did do Broadway um but she never 
she never did that. Although she did learn how to, the, the, the method acting and stuff, she ended up being very well respected by them. Um, she attended a lot of Broadway premieres that year in New York. Yeah. Cause I always wonder what would, um, like what would have happened if Marilyn had been on the stage? Because it's such a different discipline of acting than you having to have your mark and like the way that control happens in the film industry compared to the theater industry. I think she was made for stage acting. And I think that as, as somebody who doesn't know stage acting very well, this is my opinion. I think that it's, it's such a tragedy that she was didn't just that, that that wasn't what she did, you know, and and being it from California and getting into Hollywood, it was that that was it was hard for her to get into stage acting. It would have been very hard. But I think that like that a lot of the the stresses, it can't be overemphasized that the harrowing, grueling stress of the filming. And, I'm, and this is not to say that stage acting is not stressful, that, not at all, but like the cut again and again, and we didn't get it right, do it again and again, and um, this wrong and that wrong, and the hot lights and the um, the close-ups of the face and having to worry about the face all the time. And it's, um, it's, 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 that was brutal for her. And I think that Marilyn is, this is kind of weird, but I, I, I sort of see her, I can just picture her on the stage radiating this like mm. light. Her, her movements were so natural and so spontaneous. And I imagine that the stage at allows for some spontaneity that filming does not because of the strictness of the way everything is so precariously scheduled. Hi, this is Dr. Andrew Rimby, and I'm so excited to shout out the Gay and Lesbian Review, who is helping to sponsor the ITBR podcast. For all of you out there, the Gay and Lesbian Review is a bi-monthly magazine where you can discover new things about gay and lesbian literature, history, and culture. And the GL Review publishes essays in a wide range of disciplines, as well as a slew of reviews of books, plays, and movies, and a number of special features, such as artist profiles and their popular art memo column. Each issue of the magazine brings you consistently intelligent, lively, thought-provoking articles focused on a unifying theme. For example, their September-October issue centers on the theme Cracking the Closet. So, starting the 19th century, a number of artists and writers found ways to crack the closet by expressing their sexuality between the lines or in the interstices of their work. For example, Ignacio Darnad, who is a friend of the ITBR podcast, he's been on our show, writes all about illustrator J.C. Leyendecker, whose work for Ivory Soap and Arrow Collars gave him plenty of opportunities to draw pictures of well-dressed and at times scantily dressed American men. And you also can find an article by Vernon Rosario, who has been on the podcast, and he talks about the quest for sex in the Middle Ages. So to subscribe, visit glreview.org. That's G-L-R-E-V-I-E-W dot org. Click subscribe. So on their website, go all the way over to the right-hand side, and you'll see the button subscribe. Click subscribe and enter the promo code ITBR50 because you're getting 50% off your subscription to the print or digital edition of the Gay and Lesbian Review magazine. I can't wait for you all to have your copy of the Gay and Lesbian Review magazine and make sure that you take a picture when your magazine arrives or when you're reading it online and tag the GL Review on Instagram and ITBR and we'll share it out in our stories. Enjoy your reading, everyone. Happy winter. Happy holidays. I hope you all are merry and bright out there. I am here in Port Jefferson, New York, on Long Island, in one of my favorite stores. It is the Soapbox NY, a Bath and Body Boutique. I'm here with one of the co-owners, Janine. Hi, Janine. Happy holidays. Hi, Andrew. How are you? Thank you. Good. So I know you have many winter scents to walk us through. So let's yes. get started let's because go. there's a lot to talk about and it's exciting so what is this that i'm holding this is a hand wash by one of our favorite companies greenwich bay uh, it's a gingerbread scent which is wonderful very christmasy very holiday-ish 
And you can follow it up by using Greenwich Bay's lotion. It's a hand and body lotion. And to keep with that gingerbread scent is a um, sugar whip scrub. It's a body scrub that you could use in the shower. And it's by a company called Primal Elements. And it's something I'm actually using currently. And I said to Janine, and she always laughs, uh, that I really feel like I'm in Santa's bakery. So, oh, it is so yummy. It's, good. it's a good one. And then what are these adorable little yeah. soap gifts? Jumping back to Greenwich Bay. This is a great little grab and go gift. Uh, great for a stocking supper. There are mini soaps by Greenwich Bay. And it just gives you a little sample of some of their mini soaps to try. Ooh, peppermint, yeah. mistletoe, holly, yeah, it's wonderful. cranberry. Yeah, and there's some um, red in there too. And then what is this room spray? This is from company Michelle Design Works, another one of our favorites. Room spray that you can use any room in your house, just kind of freshens up the room a bit. And what is this by Michelle Design Also Works? by Michelle Design Works is Winter Blooms, one of their new scents this holiday season. It's great. It's um, a hand wash. You can use it in your kitchen or your bathroom. And then here and is something to follow it up with. Exactly. It's a hand and body lotion. And then what is this beautiful decorative candle here? One of our favorites that we actually sell mm. all year round because it's so popular. This is the scent of Fraser Fur by Times. I think I'm becoming addicted to it. Yes. I think you are because you already own one, I believe. I own one and it is a decorative candle for me because I'm about to open it, but it's just in such I know the a beautiful is, package. I don't know what's better, the packaging or the scents. I'm using it wonderful. as a holiday decoration. So cool. I'll get to the candle eventually, Thank everyone. You but it's wonderful because with Times and their Fraser Fur, not only do they carry the candles, but they also make it in the sense in the diffuser, in soap, the hand lotion, the um, the hand soap. It's just a great line and a great scent. We're going to be Fraser Fur uh, crazed this holiday season. I love it. And yeah. then what are these so adorable pajamas? My friends next to me, uh, a company called Hello Mellow. But these pajamas are so comfy. We have the t-shirts with the pajama pants. These happen to be the Nutcrackers, one of my favorite this holiday season. And then they have the night shirts too. And they're so comfy. And it says, oh, what, what fun, fun, with the little Santa hat. Yes, and we have others as well. So, Janine, how can everyone out there get their hands on your hand and body and even pajama products well we'd be more than happy to see you in our shop we're located at 18 chandler square in port jefferson village you could always call us to place an order we're happy to ship to you our phone number is 631-509-1424 you can place an order on our website soapboxny.com and you could also find us on instagram or tiktok at the soapbox and why so many options mm -hmm. I can't wait for all of you out there to just enjoy what I love so much about the Soapbox and Why. So with yeah, that, thank you so much. Happy winter, everyone. And this is going to keep you all, especially in the Northeast, merry and cheery with our cold, dark days. Yes, I know they're coming, unfortunately, but we'll yeah. survive. But this will get you that pep right, in your, your spirits. Exactly. I think so too. Yes. There we go. Happy yes. holidays. Happy Bye, holidays. Everyone. Thank you. Hi, everyone. This is Dr. Andrew Rimby, and I am so excited to be talking about Broadview Press. You might be asking, what is Broadview Press, Andrew? Broadview is an independent academic publisher in the humanities that produces high-quality, pedagogically useful books for use in university and college classrooms. They publish in the humanities mainly English studies, writing, philosophy, and history, just to name a few genres, and recently, I had on Dr. Jason Holt, who wrote all about the philosophy of sport. And what better summer episode than to talk about what happens when a philosopher dissects the beautiful aesthetics of sporting culture. In the spring, I had on Drs. Kyle Stedman and Tanya Rodriguez to talk about what is sound writing, how to make audio projects in the college classroom, how to even have your students create podcasts. And then in the winter, I had on Dr. E Dr. Jeffrey Weinstock. He talked about analyzing pop culture. Yes, I even sneak in some Real Housewives questions. And how to teach composition and make it fun. He uses this whole metaphor about being a mad scientist in this gothic lab. And in the fall, I had on Dr. Ann Stevens, and she talked about literary theory and criticism. And yes, 
the university season is upon us. So what better way to talk about the college classroom than to actually understand what is literary theory? That's a wonderful episode for all of you out there who teach literary studies. I love Broadview Press. Make sure you use their exclusive code. It's Ivory Tower on broadviewpress.com. You get 20% off all, all Broadview Press publications. Okay, until the next Broadview Press interview. And now back to the Ivory Tower Boiler Room. Yeah. I, mean, I haven't seen The Prince and the Showgirl. I've seen clips here and there, but I think that's where she really emanates like stage acting from. I don't know if you guys have seen My Week, a week, my week with Marilyn with Michelle Williams. Yeah, I've seen it. I have that was that very good. Marilyn. Yeah, and I, I love it. I it's love one, it. It's one of my favorite films to watch if I'm in a Maryland. It's one of my movie. favorites too. So. Yeah. <laughs> like you're, you're, there's a reason why you're definitely right. Picking up on this and that stage acting, radiating that because that's the first mm -hmm. film that she made where she was really applying everything that she learned at the actor's studio. The method mm -hmm. acting with Lee Strasberg was, um, Paula Strasberg was on set with her, which I mean, there were, I mean, you've seen the, yeah. you would be very accurate with all the problems that were going on, but she was 100% applying that method acting um, Strasberg stuff to that that film, which Olivier did not appreciate. He was very anti-method. <laughs> mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Oh, Elizabeth, what does it mean when they say, just because you're our like Monroe historian, not to put you on the spot, but um, what what does it mean when they say that this song, Never Met a Wolf, is going to be her big USO number? USO. Oh, are they referring to I, I, USO? In my mind, I'm thinking that that's linked to when she was um, in Korea performing for the troops. Okay. Right about that? Yes. So like, when would that have been? 54, earlier 54, um, because I think she had just married DiMaggio. They had a brief honeymoon in Japan. This was winter, very cold. They went to Korea together and they she and DiMaggio had been dating for years but the marriage only lasted nine months the crack began right with that because DiMaggio saw how much attention Marilyn was getting he didn't like it so um that would have been 54 and then when things started to fall apart there that's when she decided to go to New York yeah because in this episode no thanks for that it makes sense because they're starting to rehearse Right, we haven't gotten Christian history is made at night in full yet. I think um, the episode we get it at the end, if I'm not mistaken, maybe in this episode. They were sitting um, and singing it it's earlier, like practicing yep, it. I believe, I yes. I'm trying to, but do they actually like have us the fantasy of them on the stage? Like, I you know how, like, so. they'll show what it will look like on stage. I feel like they haven't really placed it yet. They haven't, and, not yet. No, they did Mr. and Mrs. Smith, but they haven't done History is Made at Night. No. Because I'm trying to think, like, when is History is Made at Night? Like, Joe DiMaggio and Marilyn, their love story. I'm assuming it's when they get married, which makes sense because then eventually, like you've said, Elizabeth, they'll be, she'll be in Korea for the USO number, which would then be yeah. this song, Never Met a Wolf. Yes. Yeah. I think that which that's is, the USO yeah. reference. Which is interesting because, like, then it implied that one of the wolves is Joe DiMaggio. I know. I was like, I was thinking about the, that, that same thing. Um, you know, he, I mean, he certainly was very, very different than the Hollywood wolves, 100% different, nothing in common with, with, with those men. Yeah. Well, and you weren't here on the last episode. It's when Mary gave us the bombshell news that her, um, uh, what was it, Christian? Her uncle? I think it's her uncle. I'm trying to remember, but oh, yeah. uncle knew uh, Joe DiMaggio. Her uncle played <laughs> golf <laughs> with Joe yep. DiMaggio mm -hmm. in Philadelphia, and, and he said that how much he loved her and how he never stopped loving her, and and I think he put graves on her. Uh, he put graves. He put sorry, that's a macabre dark. <laughs> but no, he put flowers on her gravestone every year. Yeah. Yes, he yes, he did. And he was the one who 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 Forever. provided the, the service. He was the one who did all the funeral services. And everything. Yes. It was perfect. Oh, really? He was in yeah. charge of the funeral service? Yep. Wow. So like that's where Elizabeth, like, 
what he would tell, you know, Mary's uncle was how um uh it could have even been her great uncle, but you know, regardless of the family relationship, like he would keep telling people how much he cared about her. So it's like, do you feel like it's true? He really saw how effed up he played a, a role in this relationship with her. Like he really, um, you, you mean he, had, regret, he regretted? He regretted his, how I he so. approached yes. her. I definitely think so. And I, there's not that much like that we know in terms of the details of their relationship when they resumed it towards the end of her life, it could have wow. been that they were just kind of finding their way back to each other as friends. And they, you know, he definitely still really held a candle for her, whether they would have, you know, rekindled things in a romantic way, who knows, but it's very, what is clear is that he was approaching her very differently this time. The second time around and really giving her the type of space that she wanted while at the same time not just not being so emotionally absent um like it's it, I think you get the feeling that he felt like he had a second chance to treat her really well he did value her he didn't know how to treat her at first because he was very much what you would call or maybe what you used to call like a man's man, like women were just a different species and you, you know, like you were loyal to them, you supported them, but like you didn't try to understand them, you know? <laughs> yeah, like he was a chauvinist. Well, I mean, I think every single man that she was involved with was aside from Milton Green. I mean, um, DiMaggio at first certainly was too. Yeah, because he told her to quit her career. Um, by the time he, he reconnected with her, he didn't, you know, he wasn't making demands like that. Um, I think that one of the reasons why he he was he was very anti Hollywood because the beginning because he saw how how messed up it was and how toxic mm. it was. So that was part of it, you know. He was thinking, "Let me save you from these Hollywood roles." Mm. That, that was in the beginning. It was there was a lot of that going on. Yeah. Yeah. I know like we're nearing the end, but Christian, what else do we need to discuss about episode four? I'm like looking here. Let's see. I mean, I, think I know I had, yeah. Anything, unless you, unless there's something else in your notes that you wanted to, that you wrote down. That you wanted to um, oh, I did want to say, I thought like Christian, Elizabeth, we'll always say together um, when I'm here with Christian that a lot of like the songs are so, like when they're doing renditions of popular songs from the 2011s, it seems um, dated in a way, even though it's like recent history. But I do have to say, rumor has it has lasted. Like Adele, you know, is still in our zeitgeist. And I love though how Karen, do you remember when she sings at the end of the episode, she has that like yes. solo moment and she says, she sings people say crazy things. Yeah. Um, and Ivy and Derek are in bed together. And that's like when Karen's singing about rumors. I thought that was a really pivotal that's moment. That's when, when you see Ivy's reflection in the in the in the uh window as mm -hmm. Derek's slowly taking down her clothes. I'm like, oh boy, that's I just love a that. Bit of foreshadowing, maybe. Yep. Yeah. Well, and that's something I wanted to ask you, Elizabeth. Like as we like head into episode five. Um, I mean, maybe it'll definitely come up in episode five, but like how open was, and maybe I've asked you this before, but for everyone who's new here listening and who hasn't like heard you do our Marilyn and Manhattan episode, which they have to, but how open was Marilyn about the actual wolves of Hollywood and their methods, like their sexual predatory nature? How, like how open was Marilyn talking about that experience? She didn't really talk, well, I don't think that she she didn't talk she hardly talked about it at all while it was going on mm -hmm. um once she i know i keep talking about marilyn moving to new york that's the the time yeah. i focused on but it so much happened there once she moved to new york city i think that she felt safe from it you have to remember she was so friendless in hollywood completely friendless um 
you know, she would have friends a little bit, but not no one she really trusted or could confide in. She was very solitary. So she didn't have anyone to talk to about that. When she got to New York City and she was away from that, she told many people, the, her new friends in New York, like Norman Rost and Sam Shaw, Arthur Miller, when she connected with him, Milton and Amy, certainly about some of these horrible things in the Hollywood Wolves. It wasn't until she felt like she was safe away from them, with that, from Hollywood, where that she felt like she could talk about it. Imagine that you're riding the Turner Classic movie, Great Movie Ride, in Hollywood Studios. It's in the 1990s. As you're journeying through the Great Movie Ride, you pass the Wizard of Oz, where all of a sudden you see the Wicked Witch of the West ascend into Munchkinland in a cloud of smoke and flames. Well, that's the memory I have with the Great Movie Ride in classic cinema when I was at Disney in the 1990s as a young boy. And ever since that, I was hooked on classic cinema. Well, my friend Christian Garcia, friend of the Ivory Tower Boiler Room, has a podcast that you all are going to love. It's called That Old Gay Classic Cinema, and he looks at queer themes in classic cinema, like Vertigo, The Wizard of Oz, Sleeping Beauty, Mary Poppins, 101 Dalmatians, Hello Dolly, the list can go on and on and on. So follow him on Instagram at That Old Gay Classic Cinema. You can listen to his podcast on Apple and Spotify. Spotify. And he also is on the premiere episode of our Queer as Folk podcast, where I'm rewatching every episode of Queer as Folk from 2000. And the episodes come out bi weekly. So make sure you listen to his episode with me. And he's launching a rewatch show of Smash, where they're putting on a Marilyn Monroe musical. So he's going to be joined by co-hosts, a lot who are in the Broadway and theater industry, and I'm going to be on his first episode. So without further ado, get listening to That Old Gay Classic Cinema. Enjoy. Hi, everyone. Happy almost holiday season. Because the holidays are upon us, I'm sure so many of you out there are thinking, oh my, what am I going to get my friends, my family, my children, my romantic partner, my husband, my wife, any, you know, significant person in your life. Look no further than my good friend, Mandy Bangle, who makes handmade crocheted items. Her company is called Mandy Made It. You can follow her on Instagram at M-A-N-D-E-E -E, Made It. And you will see all of these crocheted items that she's going to be able to customize for you, including special characters, sports team figures, even holiday items like a snowflake or a Christmas tree. So I have Mandy's keychains. I have the poison apple from Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. I have a rainbow um, flag that she made me. So Mandy is able to really customize an order just depending on what your hobbies and passions are. And you know, what item you're really looking for. So because you're listening to me talk about Mandy, she said that anyone who goes to Mandy Made It on Instagram and orders from her, and they've heard the Ivory Tower Boiler Room ad, she will give you all a free Ivory Tower Boiler Room t-shirt with your order. So head right now to Mandy Made It. You know, if you were really looking for that special gift, now you don't have to look any further because I have you covered with Mandy Made It. Okay, I hope you all enjoy your items from Mandy Made It. And please make sure that you take a photo of your crocheted items so that we can share it out on our social media. I know Mandy would love that and I would love to see what you all are ordering from her. She even has an adorable pillow called Netflix and Chill. And she has these cute coasters that she crochets for your favorite coffee or tea mug. So enjoy all your Mandy Made It products. And is that because like in that time in the Hollywood industry, anyone who she would confide in would use it against her or like would Definitely. feed the r rumor mill and like Definitely. the magazines and the press. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Or if nothing else, it would just get back to the big wigs and then they would make her life even more of a living hell than it already was. 
Yeah, it's kind of like what Judy Garland definitely went that- through. And then I think Judy actually went to New York City. Like, yeah, she yeah. had that. Yeah, yeah she, it's interesting. She did perform in various um, places in New York. And I think one of them, I'm not sure if you knew this, Elizabeth, that she went, that Marilyn and Judy actually met in real life. Um, and she, Marilyn was at one of her concerts and they hugged and it's, it was a oh, whole yeah. thing. And there's a photo of it, which I absolutely love. And I want to get it framed, but you know. <laughs> Oh gosh, it's just, it makes me so, even thinking about them meeting, it makes me sad because I think of what happened to them. I honestly wish that they worked together on a film because I think they mm-hmm. could have so much from each other. And They're both so talented. They could have helped each other. Yes. Well, and like Lena Horne was on Judy Garland's show. Yes. I feel like, um, and Diane Carroll was on Judy. I and feel Barbara. like, and Barbara, yep, too. Barbara Streisand. I feel like, what Marilyn and Judy share too is their um, progressive views around race and like Definitely. seeing their privilege as white women in the industry. Definitely, even though they were still the, mm-hmm. treated very badly, you know, by these execs, they had they they were very very conscious of the power that they that they did have. Like uh, Marilyn with um, Ella Fitzgerald, yeah, um, you know that's that she loved her work and really, really wanted to support her and, um, you know, the Copacabana and all that stuff. Yeah. Oh, is that where she in the Copacabana, like Marilyn said she wasn't going to stay unless Ella performed, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's a powerful, see, those are the moments I always say this to you, Elizabeth, this is what we need from Marilyn's life. Like we need to see the visuals of that and there's great Wait, what? pictures yeah. of the two of them um, sitting and laughing and talking, Marilyn and, and Ella. Um, yeah. It's it's those those pictures are just really great. Um, it's you, you can find them online. They're they're so delightful. Um, and you know a lot of people don't know that about about Marilyn. Mm-hmm. Well, and what year does Marilyn create her production company? So she's you know, she and Milton start working on it as early as like December, 1954, they start do the mm-hmm. wheels in the head are turning. And then that's when she sneaks off, breaks her contract. They spend all of 1955 kind of creating it. And Milton Green throws a massive, everything he has financially behind this. And um, then they form Marilyn Monroe Productions in 1955. And, th- and it was Marilyn Monroe Productions that did the Prince and the Showgirl. Oh, okay. And wait, so Some Like a Hot is 1950. I have to look it up. Eight. Okay, so this is when she has Marilyn Monroe Productions. Yes, yes. But I don't know if it was, I mean, um, sadly, Arthur Miller was such a pain that he totally broke up the friendship between Marilyn and Milton Green. Um, and mm. it, things just really took a downward spiral after after that. But yeah, Marilyn Monroe Productions was um, 1955, 1956 onward. Okay. Oh, Some Like a Hot is 1959. Okay, well, uh, yeah, Christian, I feel like we're ready for episode five because that's all about Some Like It Hot. Um, and we actually see Arthur Miller, which I forgot he actually is in the Smash show. Um, so much happens yeah. in the <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Well, okay, Christian, I'll let you, you know, end us. Well, guys, thank you, Elizabeth, so much for joining us today. We'll have you on in our next episode. Wink, wink. Um, for, <laughs> um, for our next episode of season of episode uh, five, season one. Let's be bad. Oh, cannot wait to discuss that. Guys, wait, wait for us. We'll be back. See you guys soon. Yep. See you all soon. Bye. <laughs>